Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, a King Killer Chronicle reread podcast. We are your hosts, Will and Phoenix. Let's get into it. Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, episode 30. Oh, hey, look at this completely safe OSHA compliant fireworks factory where we will be looking at chapters 62 and 63 of The Name of the Wind through the lens of advances. Oh my goodness, you are making me put that whole thing on (laughs) (laughs) the the title of the podcast when I upload it. Yes, I am. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Never not making my life fun. All right, episode 30, and we know that unless you are a brand new listener, you've heard me say this, but until somebody tells me that I don't need to say it any longer, I'm going to say it again. Hint, hint. Contact us if it annoys you. (laughs) Hint, 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 hint. Anyway, as way of explanation of our podcast, each week we will be examining a section of the book, The Name of the Wind through a chosen lens, and figuring out what we can take from the text to apply it to our real lives. We will also take some time to explore models of practical wisdom from the text with an Aristotelian phronemos of the week, and then we will expand our understanding of our own world with an interesting fact. Finally, we will wrap things up with seven words from the book and seven words from our own lives. Before we begin, let's get some disclaimers out of the way. First of all, as always, we are in no way affiliated with Patrick Rothfuss or his publisher, Daw Books. And also, as always, we're not opposed to this should it become available. Second of all, our discussions are naturally going to assume that either A, you've read the main books, The Name of the Wind and The Wise Man's Fear, as well as the other ancillary novellas and short stories in the continuity, or B, you believe that time is a flat circle and that we're all existing as a four-dimensional vector in space-time. Either way... Spoilers ahead. Finally, a word to our community. While it's perfectly fine to critique the text and characters as you read them, we're not going to stand for any abuse of the author responsible for it. And now we come to our segment in ongoing cherry avoidance, which is to say a 45 second recap of the section. All right, do you have a timer ready? I think you know the answer to this because you just handed me one. Good. All right, count me down. In three. Two, one, go. Quoth learns about bone tar from Kilvin and Manette. Quoth hopes it will fuel his rising star, and on that you can bet. While at anchors, Quoth sings and runs into Denna, so an excuse he slings, and they make haste from Thensa. They take the long way round and ramble about flowers, while Quoth makes many sounds about the height of his seductive powers. While hanging with Will and Sim, Quoth expresses regret about standing them up for a corners game he should not forget. Sim gives him advice that Quoth dismisses, though he has to think twice and the insight he misses. 32.30 seconds. Woot! So, we chose for our lens here advances, and there are a number of ways to take this. In this section, we see Quoth making advances in both knowledge and wisdom. In knowledge, in that he now is taking advanced sympathy. Hey, it's right there in the name. (laughs) And... He's also focusing his studies, which shows a little bit more wisdom. So he's focusing primarily on artificing right now, because that's the one that actually seems to be potentially profitable, and because he has certain other advances in his mind, namely the loans that he owes to Davy. (laughs) He's uh, trying to make sure that he's staying ahead of that. Understandably so. The other type of advances that we see are... The advances he starts to make towards Denna, and that she makes towards him. I have some thoughts on this, which we'll get to later, but keep that in mind. Stick a pin in it. And then, lest you think that our lens falls apart midway through, by the end, Minette has given Quoth the chance to advance to his journeyman project. It's a big change. Then things kick off in earnest with a whole bunch of talk about bone tar, which is an almost comically dangerous substance. It's flammable, caustic, acidic, it boils at room temperature, and then turns into fire fog. 
what kind of idiot doesn't think that this is going to have a payoff? I think it would be really hilarious if we have Kilvin give all of these warnings about safe and proper handling only to have everyone follow those exactly and then nothing happens. Except we know that doesn't happen. <laughs> Correct, because we know how stories work. They wouldn't tell us about this if it didn't have a meaning. Right. But you're neglecting to just acknowledge the elephant in the room of we've read this multiple times. That's true. <laughs> At the same time, dear reader, if this is your first time through, we assure you, this will pay off. Though not as quickly as a lot of the other setups that have been in this book. I don't know if you've noticed, but the ones that are big and obvious get paid off pretty quickly. This one doesn't take that long, though. True, but we are not getting to it in this section. Don't worry, there will be fun at the fireworks factory. And also during this section, Quoth discovers that Fella works in the fishery as well, though he hasn't seen her there before. Although she has been working there for two terms. <laughs> yeah, apparently she spends most of her time working with cut tile and glass. And Manette says that she's there for the equipment, not the sigildry, which... I think that that's perfectly valid. I see the little wrinkles on your nose. But what I want to point out is that she is apparently a sculptor. She works with mixed media and that's the best place to get tile cutters or anything that, you know, if I had access to a shop that had all of these pieces of equipment that while yes, they could be used for wood cutting and what you call it and making boring crap that I don't have any desire to do, but it could also help me with a craft that I really, really wanted to do. I don't blame her for that. I just don't like the way Manette seems to sound kind of dismissive about it. I don't think it's dismissive at all. I think that he's just stating a fact that she's here for the equipment, not the sigildry. Because if she was there for the sigildry, it would make more sense that both would have interacted with her in the fishery I think that it's an explanation and not derisive okay I'll accept that the other thing is that I don't think it's implied at all that the reason that she doesn't do sigildry is because of her gender that's not a thing it doesn't seem like her artistic endeavors are things that are specifically tied to her being a woman rather than only men are able to do the powerful art that is sigildry because there are other women present in the fishery quoth says so i think that it's actually really advantageous for her to think about the fact that she wants to use this equipment and maybe not for the purpose that the school delineates She's not letting the expectations dictate what she does. That's fair. And it also speaks to Kilvin being open to artistic pursuits. Absolutely. I don't think that she would have access to any of these things if A, she wasn't careful, hadn't proven herself to Kilvin, but also if Kilvin didn't want people in the fishery who weren't working on artificing. That's true. And we've seen Kilvin have appreciation for aesthetic pursuits in the past, so it makes sense. It's in keeping. And then, of course, Kilvin gives his demonstration of how this stuff works and how dangerous it is, which seems like a particularly flashy performance from an ordinarily dry science teacher. <laughs> so I would actually say that, yeah, flashy for Kilvin, but as Manette points out, not really flashy. Considering this is like the secrets of the universe here, and he's just like, eh, check this out. I'm just going to break this unceremoniously in a fire pit without any flair. And yet, it's still pretty impressive. <laughs> to be fair, that may be for the best. Because while you want people to respect it, you don't want everyone to think, ooh, I want to make me some of that. <laughs> Absolutely true. <laughs> that is very, very, very true. You don't want to make it look too cool. <laughs> so you referred to an ordinarily dry science teacher. And when I was in junior high, there were two main science teachers at my school. 
One of them, I can't remember his name, but he is the one who I think I've told this story a little bit before where he took glee in reading the warning label on the hydrochloric acid. And then we had our other science teacher, Mr. Monahan, And the reason I know that that was his name is because everyone, everyone, everyone called him Mr. Monotone <laughs> because he had no inflection. It was kind of hard to stay awake in his class unless he lit something on fire usually resulting in the alarms going off and everybody in the school having to go out for a fire drill. I kid about that, although when I was in 10th grade, my chemistry teacher had a habit of blowing up little soap bubbles with methane and then lighting them on fire. And at the beginning of every year at my high school, the alarm would go off from the entire student population would be out on the football field. I also had a bit of a personal story, and it's really a story from a teacher that I used to have. And this is about the perils of making these sorts of demonstrations too cool. My professor's dad was a chemistry teacher, and one of the demonstrations that he gave was what happens when potassium interacts with water. And he gave it a little bit of razzmatazz and made a cool looking little explosion out of a test tube. And that looked really cool. So this led my teacher, as a teenager, to get rather entranced by this idea with his friends. So they used the fact that, hey, he was able to steal his dad's keys and break into the supply room. And they saw what had happened with a tiny sliver of potassium in a test tube full of water and decided to upscale it. And they stole a brick of potassium. Holy crap. And then uh, went out for a drive and found the nearby reservoir. Holy crap. <laughs> and then threw said brick <laughs> into the reservoir to see what would happen. <laughs> um. It, uh... It was a pretty significant explosion. <laughs> I was about to say, nothing good. And that's why you don't want to make your demonstration too enticing, <laughs> too exciting. Because <laughs> that's how you get people hurt. To my science teacher's credit, they always made everything look really dangerous. Even if it wasn't so dangerous due to the simple fact that they were letting 14-year-olds do it. I mean, Quoth is 15. Oh, holy crap. I would never, 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 ever, ever let my 10th grade self ever be in the same room as that bone tar. Right? <laughs> or the 16-year-old version of my old teacher. <laughs> nope. <laughs> So I'm just going to leave this here. Everybody just be careful. <laughs> On the plus side, we do know that it wasn't malicious intent that caused the inevitable fire. So I do appreciate that Kilvin did the show not tell thing because I think it's very effective to tell people, hey, this thing makes fire fog but it's a whole different animal to show them what fire fog is. I also love that Quoth is like, okay, so why do we have this comically dangerous substance here? <laughs> because it can make blue lamps. Oh, well, in that case. <laughs> I guess supposedly it's easier on the eyes when you're reading at night. Which is funny because every piece of conventional wisdom, including your actual phone says that night mode should be a warm color. Right, and that's why map lights are red, so that you don't lose your night vision while you're reading a map at night. It's also why I prefer yellow headlamps on cars to the blue ones, because the blue ones blind the crap out of you. <laughs> Especially when they're right behind you and it's coming in through all the mirrors on a giant SUV. <laughs> when you're not driving a giant SUV. 
especially true. Because then the headlights are at your window. Ugh. Ugh. The other upside to these little bluish sympathy lamps is they fetch a much higher price. Because they require bone tar. Yep. And you'd be an idiot not to upcharge. It's hazard pay. So then, right after this little exchange with Manette, we flash forward to an evening at Anchors, where Quoth is typically seen, and he's playing his usual songs when he spies someone who looks like Denna. Oh wait, it is Denna. Surprise of all surprises. And she's there by herself. Now obviously he's gotta go talk to her, because... Yeah. Yeah, of course he has to go talk to her. He's been obsessing over her since the last time he saw her. Someone's got a crush. Yeah. It makes sense. He's young. She has been kind to him. He's impressionable. I can see why he would like her. Also, I think a lot of us turn into complete and utter idiots when we're around people that we have a crush on. So I can't be too upset with this portrayal. Although we have to remember, this is all from Quoth's perspective. And it's also important to remember he's 15. And as shown in the last time that he spent any appreciable amount of time with Denna, he doesn't seem to be truly interested in the contents of her brain. Yeah. He doesn't really want to know about what her goals are, about what she wants from life, what she's looking for in a partner, or any of that. Let's just go ahead and be fair. This is like the third time he's interacted with her. Not flirted with her. Not any of that stuff. Just interacted with her. You don't always get into those kinds of conversations, especially if you're a 15-year-old with a person that you are infatuated with. But I'd like to hope that he'd be more intellectually curious about her just in general. The thing that interests me here is she says, I'm looking for someone to walk me home. And he just kind of accepts that, but there's an implied from that's a part of that statement there that he never seems to actually question. Well, no, from Anchors. But why is she at Anchors? Exactly. It seems like a roundabout way to go to get someone to walk you home. She probably is there because she heard that Quoth is there. And she probably went there with the goal of seeing him. And with the goal of having him walk her home. I think we're getting too far into this, like, we're 35-year-old adult people that really hate fun and cuteness and stupid shirt that people do when they're 15 years old and courting people. I guess really what I'm getting at is he keeps second guessing her interest in him when I think it's actually fairly obvious that she does like him quite a bit. I will also point out though, she doesn't know him for beans either. But it seems like I'm actually moving towards something here. I think she wants to get to know him better. And I think that every time he talks about how he's afraid that he'll scare her, part of it is that he's afraid to spend too much time with his own wounds, which are massive. I mean, he's dealt with tremendous trauma in his life, which I can see why he would not want to have to open that up to someone because that would mean he'd have to confront it so i'm actually reading this a little more charitably i can understand why he doesn't want to get past these sort of surface level flirtations agreed though i also think you can have conversations about the present that don't go into the past but still express the deeper you i agree with that and they never do it. Yeah, it seems like they just keep getting into these surface level flirtations. And that's fine so far as it goes, but it would be a mistake to construe that as a deep connection. I think it would be 
a mistake to conflate it with love. Exactly. Meanwhile, to get Anchor off his back, Quoth this. No, not to get Anchor off his back. <laughs> okay. No. 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 If anyone has listened to Game of Thrones as read by Roy Detrice, you may recognize why we say no. Anyway, Quoth is skiving off. Yeah, he is. Although I have to admire the ingenuity of the way he uses Tinker Tanner. And Tinker Tanner to me is actually an interesting song because it's not just one canonical song, so to speak. It's the sonic equivalent of a communal graffiti wall where everyone is able to contribute to it and advance it and make up their own verses. And it's all Tinker Tanner. No matter which version you sing at any given time, it's still Tinker Tanner. Which I think is just this really fun little thing that exists in this world. I'm sure that there are pub songs that are like that in our world. I think it's more unique in cultures where live performance is the predominant means by which people experience music. In today's age, most music is recorded. And so very rarely do you have these interactive opportunities. But I just really love it. It's a neat little throwback, and it's a little thing about how songs can evolve and advance, like our theme. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we get our little throwback to the fact that Kvothe used to live on a roof by the fact that he can get back to his room with his loot and without damaging his loot and without the loot's case, whatever, that he can get back up into his room, deposit his loot, and come back down. And now, when I was, hell, now, not when I was, even now, I would be impressed as fork watching somebody just bound up all of the drain pipes and roofs and stuff to get back to their room like that. It kind of reminds me of that bit in Muppet Christmas Carol where... <laughs> Rizzo the rat is making a huge deal about having to climb over the fence and then back over the fence. And then he realizes, oh, wait, he forgot his jelly beans. And he just goes between the bars after all that. <laughs> so then they have a little bit of a conversation about Savoy. What about Savoy? What about him? Doesn't Denna get to make her own decisions? Dumbash. Yeah, for someone who claims to respect women, Kvothe is more caught up in patriarchal conceptions of relationships as binding contracts that limit the free association of women. Now, I suspect part of this is that he's still pretty young, and his notions of love and romance are shaped by stories and songs, which just so happen to be written for a noble audience, and therefore tend to reinforce that power structure. And that speaks to how oftentimes stories can blind us to reality, because we're so caught up in how we think something should be based on all of the things that we've heard before without actually figuring out if that matches anything real. I mean, look at how police dramas impact the way we view law enforcement. I'd also say there are expectations when courting, especially in heteroromantic or heterosexual relationships, where we expect the man to be manly and chivalrous, and the woman to be dainty, and, I don't know. Demure? Yeah, demure, easily impressed, whatever. First of all, the two of us are not that. <laughs> I'm more at home in the kitchen, and you're more at home building furniture. I mean, that's just different gender roles, but I'm saying even personality-wise... You're not effusively or performatively chivalrous, and I am no lady. You're certainly not easily impressed, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also not demure. I don't defer to you as a matter of course. I don't defer to men as a matter of course. I am quite often outspoken. And, you know, I'm generally happier with you in charge of most things around the house and in our lives. It's different than nagging. 
it's more confident in knowing what needs to be done and keeping track of it. You're just assertive, and that's good. Thank you. I would also like to point out that with Denna comes seven word sentences. He staked a claim on me then? Ugh. Uh, yeah, that, uh... Which I find very funny because Quoth hasn't talked to Savoy. And he won't for the rest of the book. Really? Yeah. The entire rest of the book? Yeah, I did a search. Savoy only appears as someone that Simon refers to by saying, Oh, I talked with Savoy, by the way. Savoy is gone for the rest of the book. Yep. Wow. Did Simon talk to Savoy in a manner that was like, do you own this woman? We don't know the contents of their conversation. Simmons just saying that Savoy's still heartbroken over Denna. Ah. It goes back to my theory of Denna being somewhat of a siren. A little bit. And there's also the notion of Denna's connection to the moon. And there was a particular sentence here that caught me. And that is, she caught a piece of my smile and shown it back at me. Which is really, I think, playing with the notion of the moon as something that reflects the light from the sun, which just seemed really interesting to me. Quoth could be an allegory towards the sun. He is the flame, after all. Yeah, and I also get the sense that Denna is someone for whom social mirroring is probably a survival strategy. She moves in all kinds of social circles and classes, so she has to be able to know her audience and speak to them as they expect to be spoken to. There's also a bit, we continued our walk, the moon was shining, making the houses and shops around us seem washed and pale. Interesting. Which is kind of how everything around Kvothe feels ethereal and washed out and unimportant any time that Denna is around. She does have a way of taking his attention off of literally everything else. More accurately, this is not something she is doing. This is something that he does with his own focus. This is Quoth's perception of the world, especially when she's around. This little section actually has some impact as we go along in the story. They're nonsense talking about roses, about other flowers... It's all talking around personalities and assumptions and observances of the other person. It's flowery language on top of being about flowers. I like, though, that she is asserting that she doesn't like being treated the same from every single man. I swear you men have all your romance from the same worn book. She's looking for someone different. I think she courts enough rich, noble buttheads that the manners and the etiquette and the things you're supposed to say get tiresome. Well, and there's an entire genre of what women want, where they talk about women as just this broad category that are all interchangeable. And that way of thinking means that naturally she's going to encounter a lot of people who don't really see any more to her than her gender and make all of their assumptions based on the fact that women want X, you're a woman, therefore you want X. Like roses. Speaking of, this is why I'm glad you don't like getting flowers. Okay, so I don't like getting flowers, especially cut flowers, because they're going to die in a week. I don't enjoy... What I view as kind of a waste of money. Give me Lego. Lego holds its value pound for pound better than gold. This is an investment. Exactly. <laughs> as we are in a room full of Lego. Mostly Star Wars Lego. Some Avengers Lego. Anyway. I understand wanting to receive lovely things. But I would rather have a potted plant even though it does represent some responsibility and the fact is I'm really bad at taking care of plants, which is funny because I've worked for two floral nurseries. I do like the descriptions and the kind of banter and 
it seems almost like Foth is trying to figure out her personality. And it seems almost like maybe this is the last time he cares about it. I kind of feel like this is him saying, okay, yeah, I know who you are now. Don't care. I don't know. It's don't care. I think it's, I know who you are now. Not going to figure you out any deeper. Much like everything else in my life. I figured you out. I don't need to be interested anymore. Meanwhile, she's pretty quick in getting to what she thinks he is. And her choice is a willow, which I thought was pretty interesting because it also seems to foreshadow his encounter with the sword tree in the wise man's fear. She describes him as strong, deep-rooted, and hidden. You move easily when the storm comes, but never further than you wish, which sounds like a pretty accurate description of him. Quoth is quoth in all situations, but he does move and change, much like Tinker Tanner. The willow moves to the wind's desire. Again, lots and lots and lots and lots of seven word sentences in this section. So yeah, he takes about five hours to walk her. Six hours. He f- interprets the last minutes to feel like an hour. Much like we have interpreted the last month to feel like 10 years. Only 10? Maybe 12? I was thinking more like 20. It's been one hell of a year. In the last seven days. Yeah. Anyway. So he doesn't really know how to send her off. So he kind of just says, bye. All right. Again, we don't need the shirt all over Quoth. He's nervous. He's never interacted really with someone he has an attraction to. He's not interpreting her as a person because sometimes that happens, especially when you're infatuated and doubly so when you are young. So we need to give a little bit of credit. We are also only seeing Foth's version of this. He is an unreliable narrator after all. So one thing I noticed here is he contrasts himself with Simon, where he says, I was painfully aware of my ignorance, while others like Simon bumbled around making ashes of themselves with their clumsy courting. And one thing that strikes me is that while Quoth is painfully aware of his ignorance and is terrified of making a mistake, it is this fear of making a mistake that prevents him from learning from mistakes. It also prevents him from not being a complete idiot. It does do that too. Because he is so afraid to do anything, he freezes and he does nothing. We don't know from Dennis' perspective if she was hoping for or receptive to being kissed. Though I get the impression that if Denna wanted a kiss, she would take it. I don't think that Denna is at all the person that Quoth portrays her as. I know... She is disliked in the fan community. I get this. But I challenge everyone who dislikes her to just remember that what you actually dislike is Quoth's interpretation of her. Yeah, this seems to me like if Quoth were to ask if she would like him to kiss her, she would give him an answer, an honest answer. And I think that that's fair. Asking for consent is sweet. And that would be the path forward. So instead, he resisted the pull of her. Again with the moon metaphors, the pull of her like the tide. She does seem to exert a sway over his movements. One other thing I'd like to point out, almost all of this is about how Quoth doesn't want to embarrass himself. None of this is, does Denna want me to really do this? Other than, like, there's a tension growing between us and it looks like she wants this and I don't know. He doesn't bother to ask her how she's feeling. She doesn't get to have any agency in this. And the reason he makes his decisions the way that he makes them is because otherwise he would embarrass himself, especially if he's reading the signals wrong. He seems convinced that the only way he can know about Denna's state is through reading tea leaves, as opposed to just, you know, asking. 
it is notable that the chapter name is Leaves. <laughs> Especially when you make it very clear that it is a lot like both trying to read Denna's mood in the tea leaves. Before we leave this chapter, Quoth reasserts that he was so not memorable and that he thinks that six months is long enough to erase Denna's memory of events, especially events that he so strongly remembers fondly. He is not giving her any credit for being an adult, intelligent person. I can remember people that I've sat next to on a plane that we've had conversations with. There was a little boy who saw me playing The Legend of Zelda The Link Between Worlds while we were on the plane to Disney World. And I remember him just spouting all of this personal information that he probably shouldn't have. And his dad kind of going, hey, kid, kid, shut up. Tone it down, kid. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone on the plane knows where we're going. No secret. <laughs> I remember that, and that was six years ago. Not six months ago. Yeah. Both's interpretation of Denna is so self-centered. I think it reveals a side of himself that a lot of people aren't comfortable with. Like, again, he doesn't trust himself enough to actually be himself around her. And so this character that we've seen be perceptive and charming and insightful and courageous ceases to be those things in her presence. And I think that's the root of why people don't like her chapters. Because Quoth, at his heart, is capable and smart, perceptive, and aware. And he prides himself on these things. And he even admits when he is not those things. He excuses them with things like, oh yeah, I had an all root in my system, so therefore I took live fire amongst the books because I'm an idiot. He at least acknowledges that. He does not do any of those things when he's talking about his relationship with Denna. He talks about how he is too afraid to do anything. He's basically paralyzed by his desire to not look like an idiot. And therefore, you know what happens? He looks like an idiot. Right. And I think also because we've spent so much time learning to empathize with this character, and he's not giving her the chance to express the same empathy back that we have for him. So, yeah, we don't like who Quoth becomes when he's around Denna. So I choose to instead blame Quoth. I don't like Quoth. <laughs> I have no problem with Denna. I don't think we have enough information about her as an actual person to make a judgment of her one way or the other. Our next chapter sees Will and Sim and Quoth interacting, mostly talking about how hopelessly unable to interact with women Quoth is. And when I say women, I mean one woman, and I mean Denna. It's clear that he's pretty head over heels for her. He goes out of his way looking for her. <laughs> So while getting some supplies in Emre, I happened to also go to the inn where she's staying. And then I also went to the Aeolian and then also to the park where we stopped. And I didn't see her, guys. <laughs> but I just happened to do this. Right. And then, oh my goodness, he has completely blown off his friends. Not at all thinking about them. Going, well... This one thing has stuck itself into my brain and washed out everything else. This one thing is a woman. Yeah. And I don't want to get into the whole guy friends versus girlfriends thing. No. I don't think that that's really what that is at all. But I also think he did have at least plans with them. And they would at least be worried about him. So what I would say is if Kvothe had any actual friends who were women at this point he'd have blown them off too <laughs> yep i don't know i'm not the type of person that forgets i have plans part of it is my anxiety actually just replays over and over anything that's a future date that i know about and just tells me over and over don't forget friday you have this thing don't forget friday you have this thing don't forget you have this thing on friday 
common courtesy, you just, you know, send a note. To be fair, we take for granted the ability to quickly communicate with someone at a moment's notice through the little technological devices in our pockets that are more powerful than the computers that put people on the moon. <laughs> that said, we also know that runners are a thing in this society, although it's always ambiguous as to how said runners know where to find people, but they always do. Runners are not afraid to ask people questions. Either that or there's some magic, which could also be the case. But my point is that Kvothe would be a terrible runner. Oh, yeah. Because he refuses to ask people for help. Well, and the other thing that he could do is he could have said, hey, while we're out, I need to swing by to let the guys know what's going on. But it's probably in the opposite direction of where Denna is ultimately trying to go. Well, we've already seen that he has got no problem with taking a roundabout route if it means he gets to spend more time with her, so... There are just some things that he could have done to make it a little bit less of a problem for his friends. Now, fortunately, Will and Sim are actually pretty considerate about it and don't give him too much guff. Maybe just a little light teasing. Although, I do have to say that it amused me that the place where they ended up going to drink was the library, which made me think, oh... Is the Emirates also in Temerant too? For those of you who don't follow the English Premier League, the team Arsenal FC in London plays in a stadium called the Emirates, which is known for being large and cavernous and silent because it's filled with rich people, because those are the only ones who can actually afford tickets there. And thus, the place has come to be known as the library. Shh, we're trying to watch the football. During the teasing, it comes out that it took six hours to get Denna back to her hotel and Willem and Sim have this adorable little exchange. They've done this before. They talk amongst themselves in front of Quoth as though Quoth were not there. Willem taps Simon on the shoulder. He's telling the truth. Simon asks, why do you say that? He sounds more sincere than that when he lies. I think they also do this because they know that Kvothe, who is an inveterate eavesdropper, only really listens to people when they're talking about him, rather than when they're talking to him. A point that you made the last time we spoke about this. I also was amused how he goes, I don't ramble, we just walked and talked for six hours. <laughs> Which is like the dictionary definition of rambling, in every sense. Multiple interpretations of a word. <laughs> Then someone says, if I didn't know any better, I'd say you're scared. Quoth says, you're damn right I'm scared. Like I said earlier, I think his fear is really just confronting the parts of himself that are wounded. You know, I can empathize with that. It's also okay to be scared by that. But ultimately, he is going to have to confront that part of himself. Meanwhile, Simon, who's supposedly an idiot, says, she came looking for you. She obviously wants something from you. Which, as we've said is pretty much right on the nose. I don't think that if I had no interest, either friendship-wise or potentially romantic-wise, in a person, but especially the friendship thing, I don't think I'd just show up where they were performing, nor would I be making an effort to interact with them. Obviously, she wants to speak with him and or get to know him better, and I don't think that he ever, ever lets her get to know him better. This is one of Quoth's central character flaws. He doesn't let anyone get to know him. I think that he lets Ari get to know him. That's true. I think Ari is someone that he can immediately recognize his own woundedness with because he sees it in her. So it's easier for him to accept that. I think part of it is because Ari rejects notions of social decency. Ari never puts on a mask, and so there's no unmasking to do. It's interesting that you say that he recognizes his own wounds in Ari, where I think that Denna is also a very wounded character, but he doesn't have that empathy with her or for her. I think part of it is because he always encounters her first in social situations where, unlike Ari, Denna 
even though she chafes under the societal restrictions and expectations, ultimately puts on a show of conforming to them. So there's this portion of her that she is hiding. Like, Ari doesn't hide anything, whereas Denna does. And I think Kvothe mirrors that. With Ari, he's able to just be himself as himself, and that's good enough. Whereas around Denna, she has a mask over her wounds, and he keeps his mask up as well. And neither of them are able to really lower that defense around one another because they're so terrified of being hurt. It's an interesting dichotomy between the two. I wonder, though, if part of the reason that Denna keeps disappearing is because she doesn't want to be known or seen. I can see that. And then to wrap up the chapter, Manette has given me permission to start my journeyman project. And as awkward as that transition that I just did was, it's the same in the book. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) So what are you going to do for your project? A sympathy lamp? Everyone does a sympathy lamp. Yeah, Manette told me to stick to a sympathy lamp. And he's listening. Yeah. What? (laughs) Again, advances in wisdom. Yes, this is a lesson that I didn't really internalize for some of the things that I did in college. I remember. So (laughs) there was a project that I had to work on that was, I think I chose to do a puzzle game. I'm not sure exactly what the theme I was supposed to be following was, but I chose to try to do a puzzle game and rotational physics are tough. And I just kept beating my head into the wall, trying to understand them. Yeah, I remember that one. That was, uh... That was terrible. That was very, very terrible. Very, very, very anxiety-inducing and very terrible. However, while I don't have fond memories of making the project, I do have fond memories of being the TA for the class about two years later. And giving my professor permission and actually kind of asking him to explain to his class what happens when you bite off more than you can chew. While I was in the class going, don't do what I did. Do as I say, do do what I did. (laughs) You learned that one the hard way. What's worse is that the next semester I kept trying to do it. Same project, sort of, just different art. Yeah... Ah, my dad always did say that I was stubborn and thick-headed. I am not going to countermand that. (laughs) I think that segues nicely into our Phrenemos. Now does it? Yes, it does. So who did you pick this week? I picked Kilvin. While he only shows up very briefly, I think it's very telling and very core to how he is as a character like we learn a lot about Kilvin by his actions including the pragmatic way he goes about showing everyone in his shop that this thing which has a purpose and a use and if you're careful can work for you can also very very easily become a weapon or a shop accident much more easily than anything else in the shop and I think that it's definitely while it's the show don't tell his showing not being a flashy other than being on fire but not being a performative show and tell is definitely a service to the people he is trying to protect he doesn't make it look awesome to make caustic fog He makes it look like he made caustic fog. And everything that that entails. But now, also, everyone in the shop will not be curious about what would happen if they screwed around with this liquid. They are not going to wonder, well, how bad could it possibly be? He's given them a nice object lesson in a safe environment. And as a result, his students will not go throwing blocks of potassium into reservoirs. Exactly. (laughs) So that was my choice. It's a good one. 
I generally like Kilvin a lot. I think he's got a lot of wisdom to him. And now it is time for an interesting fact. That's right. No cherries this time, I'm betting. Well, you better interest me. Well, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a phoenix, in want of an interesting fact, generally enjoys them when they're about dinosaurs. Just remember, we still have cherry-flavored Australian candy. Just throw that out. We don't need it. It's also really old, and it expired in February. We don't need it! Just... just so anyway, typically, we imagine dinosaur eggs to be large, hard-shelled affairs like we see in modern birds and the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park movies. However, until recently, paleontologists had only been able to find fossil evidence of eggs from advanced theropods, so long-necked dinosaurs like the Brachiosaurus, advanced sauropods, two-legged predators such as Tyrannosaurus rex, and advanced hadrosaurs like duckbill dinosaurs, which were all from the Cretaceous period. And we had only been able to assume that the eggs of earlier dinosaurs from the Jurassic and Triassic periods were similarly hard-shelled. Are you telling me that dinosaurs had eggs like turtles do? That is correct. Soft, leathery eggs, to be specific. So, yeah, we hadn't found much in the way of evidence for the eggs of ceratopsian dinosaurs, like Protoceratops, Styracosaurus, or the Taurosaurus. Until recently, actually, when we found some evidence of Protoceratops eggs in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. When paleontologists analyzed the shells, they found no evidence of pre-fossilization calcification, like we would with a hard-shelled egg. Because these aren't hard-shelled eggs, they're much more rarely preserved. So as a result, they typically would have decayed before fossilization could even happen. This was a rare case where it did happen, and so it gave us an insight into how these particular shells were created. We also happened to find eggs from a Mosasaurus, which is a giant sea monstery type dinosaur, also similarly leathery and soft, which implies that hard-shelled eggs evolved at least twice separately within dinosaurs. Convergent evolution? Yep, exactly. That's always really fascinating to me, how things that just work can evolve without any outside interaction in two separate instances. So, interesting or not? So, I think, while it's not something I ever thought about before, because we always have this little mental model of, of course dinosaur eggs are hard, it is definitely interesting to me to think about how evolution has occurred and why changes were made throughout the genome, throughout history. Yeah. So, no cherries for me? Debating. Hmm. You just said it was interesting to you to think about how this changed your perception of things, so I think that's a no for the cherries. Don't push your luck. Give me a chance to think about it. Well, that was entertaining enough. You win. Yes! <laughs> I did find it very interesting. Well, good. I'm glad. I'm glad you liked that one. I love dinosaurs. You do. So do I. And so now it is time for us to share our seven words. I believe it's your turn to share some from the books. I believe you are correct. What do you have? So there are a lot of seven word sentences floating around in chapters that Denna is also present in. Perhaps you think too little of yourself was one that I was considering. So I resisted the pull of her. The willow moves to the wind's desire. Even, you make a good case for roses. But because I like asking questions, and I'm genuinely curious about what you and or our audience would say, my seven words are, what flower would you pick for me? <laughs> Now that's an interesting question. I don't particularly care for flowers myself, so don't know. That's a cop-out and you may not do that. Too bad, I just did. If I had to pick something, it would probably be a potted lavender plant because it's resilient and it has its own unique character to it 
that has a way of calming things down, helping things to make sense. So you view me as medicinal? I view you as an order Muppet. <laughs> I do love the smell of lavender. That's a large part of it. You calm me down quite a bit. Thank you. Dear audience, what flower would you pick for me? And what flower would you pick for Will? What would you pick for me? Ooh. Hmm. To say lavender would be a cop-out, although you also do the job of calming me down. But also jasmine. It's unconventional. It's not so widely common. But the smell, it just it makes me happy. Its presence makes me happy. A nice jasmine green tea is probably the most like home that I could feel when it comes to a tea. And you're a very most like home type person. Aww. Dear audience, please have your buckets at the ready. You're gonna be vomiting. We're sorry, but we're not. <laughs> All right. With that, it's my turn to share my seven words from life. And mine is, I just need to finish my thing anything. <laughs> and what made you say that? I needed to finish my thing anything this morning. <laughs> and it was just kind of fun to say. <laughs> what? It's fun to say. I knew it would make you laugh. How could I resist? I must say, I knew it would make you laugh is also a fantastic seven words. Well, you bring them out in me. And with that, I think it's about time for us to wrap up. Thank you so much for potting with me. And thank you for potting with me. And thank you, audience, for listening to Tales from the Waystone. We're sorry we ended it with a vomit joke. Not that sorry, though. Join us next week on Tales from the Waystone as we discuss chapters 64 and 65 of The Name of the Wind through the lens of Sight Unseen. We would like to extend a huge thank you to our friend Shawnee Jang for our theme music. And many thanks to Patrick Rothfuss for creating a world that we've enjoyed exploring. Audio production, editing, and social media coordination, courtesy of me, Phoenix McCullough. And project management and writing, courtesy of me. Will McCullough. If you are able to and would like to, we would love it if you would consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash waystonepod, where you can get early access to the pod, our show notes, custom digital posters, and other exciting items. And as always, here's to one more day above the roses. To one more day above the roses. Ding! Foot. <laughs> I push the foot button. Foot. Foot. <laughs> Me. Me. Snoot. Snoot. No. Why you boop the snoot? Because you said snoot. And then you booped my toe. <laughs>